It's always a joy to come home, and that's what I've done tonight, of course. This is home uh, in many ways. But it's, this is home because I'm a member of this church, and I appreciate it. If I didn't, I wouldn't be a member of it. And I thank God for what it's doing. And I thank God that it doesn't stand still. It's going forward all the time. And so it's a real joy to be here tonight. And I want you to pray as I speak that God will use His Word to convict hearts and draw souls to Christ. I know you want to see souls saved, and so do I. And that's what we're here for tonight. So you pray. And after I pray, I'm going to tell you why I'm delivering the sermon that I am tonight. The subject is not new. And the sermon will not be new, but it has burned its way into my heart in a new way and a much more forceful way than it has ever the 38 years that I've been preaching. And I've preached on the subject that I'm using tonight many times. But if I can get across to you what God has gotten across to me in preparing this sermon, then I feel that some of you may go away from here tonight with a deeper determination to win some of your loved ones and neighbors and friends to Christ, some of them that are lost. You'll win them to Christ. Will you bow your heads just a moment, please? Our Father, we thank Thee for the privilege of prayer. We thank Thee, our Father, that we can call upon Thy name. In the name of Jesus, we are invited to call upon Thy name, and we are invited to make our desires and our needs known to Thee. And so, Father, tonight... I need thee every hour, I need thee every moment of every hour, but this is the hour that I need thee most, this day, now. Because if this message is my message, then, Father, there'll be no message. But if it's God's message, then someone will be moved. Someone will be convicted. Someone will be drawn to God. And so I commit soul, spirit, and body to thee. And I pray, God, that you'll take this voice and this heart of mine, and I pray that you'll speak to these dear people and those, I don't know who they are, I do not know how many, I cannot see the heart, but Father, you see the heart, and I pray that every person in this building tonight who is not born again will be convicted deeply and drawn mightily and saved by God's grace before this service comes to a close. We thank thee for this church, and Father, I do not pray hypocritically when I say I thank God for this church for the mission program for the children's home for the school for the pastor that you've used here in such a special way God bless this pastor give him wisdom give him strength he needs today in this hour a double portion of wisdom and grace and strength and courage father so you equip him for the days ahead and bless those who work with him in Jesus' name we ask it. Now, Father, I commit the remaining moments of this service to Thee. May Thy will be done, and God shall have the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm speaking tonight on hell. Now, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm using the subject hell. A few weeks ago, one of my dear friends who lives in another city, in fact, he lives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, called me on the phone. In fact, the phone rang, and I don't usually begin a sermon this way, but I want to tell you why I'm preaching on hell tonight. I want to tell you what the Lord used to impress me to use the subject that I'm using tonight. And this, the phone rang, I picked it up. And at first, I thought it was some uh, somebody uh, calling a quack call or somebody to maybe threaten me or something because all I could hear was a groan. Just a muffled groan. I couldn't understand what was being said. And then I said, who is this? And finally, I understood his name and I said, what's wrong? What in the world's wrong? And he said, I've just gotten a message from my son that my little granddaughter was playing with some other children in the yard and the neighbor was burning trash. It was in the early fall and leaves were piled high and uh, other uh, limbs and, and things, they'd piled up and they'd set on fire and they were burning trash. And this man said, uh, my little granddaughter was out there 
and a little boy pushed her into the fire. And that's the last thing he said. He absolutely could not speak. He was so grieved and so heavy and so burdened and so broken, he couldn't speak. And then in a few minutes, the phone rang again and he called back and he said, pray. And that's all he said, hung up. Now, here is the thing that gripped me. Here is the thing that gripped me as I've never been gripped about hell and the people who are in hell right now. There was a man. His granddaughter, his little granddaughter, about I think maybe six, five or six years old, had been pushed in the fire. She was not dead. He did not know how badly she was burned. But he was so terrified and so broken until it absolutely took away his voice and he couldn't talk. He couldn't tell me what he wanted to tell me. And then the next day he called back and explained to me that at that time she was in the emergency room. He did not know the extent of the burns. It was very serious and she'll be scarred very badly and she's still being treated. But I'm saying to you, that if a little child being pushed into a fire could cause a man to lose his speech and be burdened and broken to that extent, my God, shouldn't we be concerned about the thousands in Greenville that are going to hell? I'm going to tell you something, friend, and you may not agree with me. We don't believe in a Bible hell like we ought to believe in it. If we did, we'd spend more time trying to get people ready to stay out of hell. And I'm going to tell you tonight, as I studied and I did study and I spent hours studying. I've been preaching 38 years, but it takes me longer, much longer, to get up a sermon now than it did 37 years ago. All I had to do then is read a verse of scripture and preach two hours. Now it takes me two weeks to get up one sermon. And I'm not joking. I'm not, I'm not just saying that. Because the more you study this Bible, the more you'll see that you need to study it to really understand what God's saying to you. Now, here's the reason that I have been gripped. And since that call came... I don't know why. I really don't know why it got a hold of me like it did. Because my, I don't, I've never had a loved one burned. I, I saw a man in the hospital in Salisbury, North Carolina when I was there in the tent. He was drunk. He gave out a gas. He got a five-gallon can of gas. He poured gas in the tank. He was drunk. He poured it all over himself. He spilled it all over his clothes. And he got a little in the tank, a lot on the ground. A lot on his clothes. And then the poor drunk sat the can down and struck a match to light a cigarette. And I saw him in the Salisbury Hospital. And I saw the nurse raise up the sheet. And you're not going to like this, but I'm going to tell you because I'm going to tell you something worse than this before I'm through. She raised up the sheet and let me see the maggots eating his legs where they were burned. Now let me tell you something, friend. I believe in a literal burning Bible hell just as strongly as I believe in a beautiful heaven. And souls are in hell now burning now. All right. We should read a little text, I suppose. And I'll read some scripture. It's very familiar. Preached by the greatest preacher that ever preached. The hottest sermon on hell you'll ever read. The clearest sermon on hell you'll ever hear. And these, these words fell from the lips of the Lamb of God. And here's what he said in Mark 9, 43. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life main than having two hands be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where thy worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life main than having two feet 
to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their sore worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter light into the kingdom of God rather with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, I don't know any better scripture to read as a foundation, as a text for a sermon on hell. I don't know any better. In fact, I don't think there is any better in the Bible. Now, with that in mind, with that in mind, I want to answer some sensible, timely questions about hell and what the Bible tells us about hell and why I believe that you and why I believe that I should be more concerned about the people who are not ready to die and who are not prepared to meet God and who will not stay out of hell unless we get them saved through the gospel. You can't go to heaven unless you're born again. In this year, 1974, and it's almost 75 now, but in this modern streamlined atomic age, you must be born again if you hope to escape the damnation of hell. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to make a few brief statements, and I'll spend most of my time on the last part of my sermon. But a few brief statements, questions and answers like this. Was there a time when there was no hell? According to the Bible, there was. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's Genesis 1-1, and there's not a word, not one word, not one suggestion of hell there. In the beginning, God created the heaven, singular, and the earth, singular. And there's not a word about hell. You get this in your mind, and you keep this in your mind. God Almighty has never created anything and never will create anything just for the joy of creating. God creates for a purpose. He's all wise. And God hasn't made anything he doesn't need. And God's not going to make anything he doesn't need. And there's no surplus of anything if we take care of it as God would have us take care of it. And if we'd had a Joseph on the scene... You wouldn't be paying two dollars and a half and three dollars a pound for beef and a dollar a pound for fat back now if we'd had somebody with some sense in Washington. Say amen or drop dead. Don't make any difference to me. Either one. You say you must be a Democrat. No, I'm Baptist. I thought the pastor told you that. I belong here. We need somebody in, in, in this country. We need some men in Washington. We need some men in Columbia with some good common sense. And if they had some good common sense, the first thing some of them would do is pray. Now, there was a time when there was no hell. God didn't need a hell. And God didn't create a hell in the beginning. But God did create a hell later. Now, how much later? I can't tell you. I don't know. I don't know how much later. I don't know whether it was a century or whether it was ten centuries. I don't know. But I do know that somewhere along the line, Lucifer decided he could overthrow God, take God's kingdom and God's throne, rather, and exalt his throne above the stars of God. And God cast him out. And the angels that he led astray, God cast them out. And then it was, and I don't know when it was, doesn't make any difference, but then God had need of a place called hell. And God created it, or God prepared it. And in Matthew 25, 41, you'll find that hell was prepared for the devil and the devil's angels. Now, I don't know when God did it. That don't make any difference. But I know why God did it. I know why God did not do it in the beginning. God had no need for a hell. I know why God did it when he did. God needed a hell. And so he prepared it. With that in mind, I want to ask an answer from the Bible. Just where is hell? 
Now, everybody agrees that heaven is up. Whichever direction that is depends on how the earth is spinning on its axis. But it's in the sides of the north or up. We're not going to discuss that because that's beside the point. Because when I take off to heaven, I won't have to know where it is. I'll go anyhow. Amen. When I start. God knows the way and I don't have to know the way. I just know I'm ready to go. Amen. I'm ready. I'm prepared. I'm born again. I haven't done all I'd like to do. Haven't been all I'd like to be. But I'm prepared. If I go tonight, I'm prepared. And I'm not worried about arriving. I'll get there. Amen. All right. But the Bible teaches that hell is down. Now from where you're sitting, hell's right under you if it's down. Down in the center of this earth. Now you say, preacher, that doesn't matter. Well, that's all right. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. But maybe that will explain to you and to some of the scientists and geologists why we have rivers of molten lava, liquid fire, running from live volcanoes. And in the past, they have buried cities. And in the future, if Jesus tarries, it'll happen again. Now, I'm, I, I can't read these. I don't intend to. But I looked in my concordance. And in Isaiah 14, 9, God said, Hell from beneath. So that's down. In, in, in Isaiah, that's Isaiah 14, 9. Isaiah 14, 15, again. Hell from beneath. That's down. Then in Ezekiel 31, 16, they were cast down to hell. That's down. And then again in Ezekiel 31, 17, down. In Ezekiel 32, 27, down to hell. And then in Numbers 16. And we could spend a lot of time here, but I'm not even going to turn to it. Because if I turn to it, I will spend a lot of time there. And so I'm just going to give you the outline of it, and you can read it when you get home. That's number 16. You can begin with verse 29 and read several verses. And God said, Moses, I want you to go down and deliver a sermon to Korah. And Moses went down. And the first thing he said, he said, if these people die a common death, I want you to underline, I want you to underline that common death. You know, you say... He died a natural death. There's no such thing. There is a common death, but death is unnatural. God didn't create men to die. God created Adam to live. God is life. And why in the name of common sense would God Almighty, who is life, why would he create a man to die? Man dies because of his stubborn, rebellious will. That's why he dies. Adam rebelled against God, and he died. He died spiritually the minute he did. And if he had never sinned, Adam and Eve, if they had never sinned, they'd be alive tonight. They'd still be living. Now, you may not believe that. That's beside the point. The thing I want you to do is to be born again. If you'll just be born again, we'll forget about Adam and Eve. But God did not create men to die. Men die because of sin. The wages of sin is death. So these, and Moses didn't say, if these men die a natural death. He said if they die a common death. God didn't send me. But he said if God create a new thing, if these people die an uncommon death, one that's not common, then you know God sent me. And just as he said the last words of his sermon, before he could even pronounce benediction, the earth split open, the earth clave asunder. That means opened up. The earth opened up, and Korah and all that appertained to them, their houses and everything they had, the earth opened up, and the whole company and everything they had went to hell alive. They dropped into the pit. Now, I think 
That's enough. Scripture. To prove to anyone that's interested that hell is down. And from where we sit and where we stand, that's down beneath us. Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. Right? Amen? Amen. The Pharisees said, show us a sign that you are the Messiah. And he said, I'll give you one sign and only one. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the psalmist David said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Now Jesus descended into the paradise side, into the side where the righteous spirits were at that time. He went into that part where Abraham was and where Lazarus went. When he died, Jesus did not go into the fires of hell, but he did descend into the paradise side of hell. There are no saints there now. When Jesus rose again, he led captivity captive and he carried them far above all heavens. And so they're there now. But Jesus went into the heart, and that's the center of this earth. One more scripture, and I'm not turning. Revelation 9, 1. An angel descended with a key to the bottomless pit. And he unlocked and opened up that bottomless pit, and smoke came out and covered the earth. Locusts came out of the smoke. So it seems to me that if you're concerned about that burning inferno... Where some, I'm so sorry to say, some of my relatives are. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. None of my immediate family. Because there's only one little boy. And my little boy, my little brother died at two. And of course, the grace of God takes care of babes, little innocent children. My little boy died when he was two days old. He's in paradise. But when I say my relatives, I'm not talking about my immediate family. But some of my relatives, some of my cousins, my uncles, they died without God. And they're in hell. And I have some more that'll go if they don't get saved. Because I have some relatives that drink and gamble and lie and cheat. And if you don't have some relatives that are lost, you are most fortunate, my friend. You're most fortunate. And you ought to praise God to the highest heaven. Amen. Now, the next thing I want to say is this. If you are so unfortunate as to die and go to hell. If you open your eyes in hell, as the rich man did, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. The rich man also died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. And if you die, and if you lift up your eyes in hell, the first thing you're going to discover, and discover it in a real, real way, is... That God did not intend for you to go there. And you're going to find out that you're not wanted down there. They don't want you in hell. They don't want you in hell. I said they don't want you in hell. And I don't want to be anywhere I'm not wanted. I'm sure that this will never happen. Unless I lose my mind, and if I do, then of course I won't be responsible. But if I found out Tabernacle Baptist Church didn't want me, you wouldn't have to turn me out. I'd get out. And I wouldn't ask for a letter. I'd just call or write and say, just take my name off the book. Now I'm saying that to say this. It's a miserable state 
It's a miserable feeling. It is a miserable life to be somewhere with someone where you're not wanted. Preacher, do you have any scripture for that? The rich man, after he found out there was no way for him to get out of hell, and found out there was no way for him to get a drop of water, and when he learned there was no way for him to receive any mercy, his final request was, Father Abraham, I have five brothers. Send that old leper that was covered with running, stinking sores. Send him to my daddy's house and tell my five brothers that I don't want them to come where I am. Tell them not to come to this place of torment. Is that scripture say? Is that right, huh? Now, mister, they're praying in hell tonight. They're praying and praying and begging that God will send somebody to your house to tell you to stay out of hell. Now, I'm not critical. I, I'm not. God knows my heart. I've tried all down through my ministry. I've tried hard not to go out on a limb, not to go off on a tangent, not to run down blind alleys and criticize preachers and churches. I've tried my best. But I'm saying this, beloved. You don't hear much hell fire from the pulpits today. Not much. It's become old-fashioned, outmoded, and higher criticism of the Bible, new translations have softened it down. But I'm going to tell you, my friend, God Almighty's eternal word is forever settled in heaven and they can't change Bible doctrine about hell. It can't be changed. Now, if you go to hell, you'll be out of place because God didn't create you for hell and God didn't create hell for you. And there are some who teach that not all men can be saved. But my Bible teaches that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. And that takes in everyone. So what I'm saying to you is this. God created you to love and to worship and to be happy and to enjoy life. God didn't create you to be sinful and mean and ungodly and dirty and filthy and then go to hell when you die. God didn't create you to go to hell. And it's not God's will but that a few perish who were not elected. Is that Bible? Huh? No, that's not Bible. Here's the Bible. It is not God's will that any perish but that all do what? Tell me. Repent. Come to repent. Well, since you're not a devil, now some of you women think you married the devil, but you didn't. And some of you men think you married the devil, but he's not a she. So you didn't. Sometimes he wears dresses, but he's a he. So, mister, you didn't marry the devil. Well, you say, I married his sister. No, he don't have any sisters. Just sons. That's all. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, right? Now, what I'm saying is this. You're not an angel. You're not a devil. God didn't create you for hell and God didn't prepare hell for you. So to be out of place is hell. Now don't, don't take me wrong here because I, I, I'm going to tell you something that's the honest truth and my wife's sitting back there and David's back there. And they know I'm telling the truth. I'd rather sit on a nail keg 
and eat a McDonald's hamburger, hard as either one, don't make any difference. I'd rather sit on a nail tag and eat a hamburger than to go to some of these big shot banquets where they have enough silver, God bless you, to open a silver store and enough drinking glasses that you don't know which one to start with. And all that junk, and they serve in courses. I just rather get all mine wrapped up in one bun. Amen. That's right. <laughs> then I know what I've got to eat. Now just go ahead and eat it. Amen. I'm not a big shot. Never have been a big shot. Don't want to be a big shot. I'm a little shot. And I like it. The only time you ever catch me with a hamstring on is when I'm in the pulpit. That's right. And if you've ever been to the Gospel Hour office, you know that's not a joke. That's a fact. Amen. I don't have but one tie. I don't need but one. And it'll last me five years. Amen. That's all right. I don't blame you for wearing a tie. My, my wife's dad, I was in the family, I guess, 30, well, uh, 30, almost 30 years before he died. And I never saw my wife's dad come out his door in the morning. And I saw him a lot of times that he didn't have on a necktie with a stick pin and a handkerchief to match that tie. He loved it, and I loved it for him. And I never criticized him, and I won't criticize you. But I almost wore a sport, sports shirt here tonight to preach, and if I hadn't thought somebody would think I was a Catholic father, I would have. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> but I hate a caller. I always did feel sorry for my daddy's mules <laughs> when I put the collar on I can really sympathize with them amen now what I'm saying to you I love to be with ordinary folks and I believe God intended for people to be ordinary I don't believe God ever intended for any of us to be big shots do you say huh all right now, the next thing I want to say about hell, hell is not what some preachers say it is and what some theologians teach that it is and what some writers have written that it is. They write about a mystical place, a fictitious place, not real fire, not a real place, but just a state of mind. And just a place where spirits float around and don't know anything and don't enjoy anything. That's not the kind of a hell my Bible teaches. I'm going to, now is the, the place that I'm going to spend the rest of my time. And I promise you faithfully that I, for my sake, more than your sake, I'm not going to preach as long as I used to. I'll guarantee you. First place I couldn't if I wanted to. So I have a watch and I'm going to keep time. But I'm going to use the rest of my time describing what burned my soul like I've never been burned inwardly. And the disciples said, did not, did not our heart burn within us? Some of us need to get holy heartburn. Amen. And God can give you holy heartburn. I'm going to tell you what burned my heart that night. When that man that I know so well, and I know him well, was so broken and so grieved and so moved that he couldn't even talk. Hell is a place of torment. Now, I am not a scholar of any type. And I'm certainly not an English scholar. And I'm not an authority on the English language. But Webster gave to us a dictionary that's supposed to be an authority, a book that speaks with authority. Like the Bible speaks about spiritual things with authority, when you look up a word in Webster's dictionary, you can depend on the definition. It's right. And so I've preached on hell and I've talked about the torment and I've talked about the weeping, and I've talked about the wailing, and I've talked about the gnashing of teeth, and I've talked about the rich men howling. But I'd never taken time to look up those words until I prepared this sermon. And I looked them up. 
You know what it means? You know what torment means? You know what it means? It means to be tortured, to be distressed, to be vexed, and to be twisted. That's what it means, that's what torment means. And you know the example that Webster gave, the example? If you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, they had what they call the wheel. And they'd tie a Christian to the wheel and twist him until his eyeballs popped out, his blood vessels burst, and his bones popped out the skin. That's torture! That's torment! That's hell! And while you and I sit here, and when I was sitting over there a few minutes ago and sweat pouring off of me and my glasses fogged up and I couldn't even see these fellows on the front seat, I said, well, Brother Harold has prepared the place for me tonight. Amen. I tell you, it's right. I've got the right subject. The Lord told me I did, and then the preacher did. Amen. So I knew I was right. In the mouth of two witnesses, you know. Amen. So I said, this is it. Can't be wrong tonight. And if I don't drown, I'm going to finish. Amen. But you don't worry about me sweating because I've been sweating so long. Till it's, if I didn't sweat, I'd call a doctor. Amen. I would. And I don't perspire either. My hide leaks. Amen. <laughs> now, I looked up that word torment. I quoted a little bit of scripture a moment ago from Luke 16. And please don't turn because you won't have time. I'm going to leave it. It's Luke 16. The rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes and he cried. And he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented. I'm tortured. I'm perplexed. I'm twisted in this flame. A flame will make you twist. God have mercy. I have several patrolmen that come to my office for books. And some years ago, I don't know, you know time goes so fast. I told you folks, I'd be 60. Of course, I know I look like I'm 70. I got a lot of mileage on me. But I'll be 60 if I live until Valentine's Day. And time goes fast. I remember I told you, I've told you two or three times in meetings here, my dad told me when I was a boy, I thought when my dad reached 50, I thought he was dead with old age. And he told me that the older you get, the faster time goes. I didn't believe him then. I'm 60 now. If I should live to be 70, I'm not going to ever get out of bed again. Because I wouldn't get my britches on, it would be time to go back to bed. Amen. So no need to get up. Just stay in the bed. Because I don't much more to get my britches on now until it's time to go back to bed. You just don't get anything done in a day. Amen. Say, huh? You know, Christmas has come and gone, and I don't know where it went. Because it went so fast, I didn't get a glimpse of it. Really, I'm not joking. Coming over here tonight, I saw Christmas trees in windows. And I said to my wife, I said, that's the strangest thing. That looks so funny. Of course, we took ours down Christmas morning. I don't get the thing out of there. Amen. I don't like it hanging around. When it's over with, let's get rid of it. Amen. But what I'm saying, I was going to say, we have several patrolmen that come out there to get books. And this man told me some years ago, that down here, I don't know how the road is now. I'm sure it's been changed, but it learns. I went un under the, under the uh, railroad many times on the little two-lane road going south. I haven't been that way in a long time. But one night, a dark, well, kind of like last night, rainy, dark, foggy night, a man was coming up from Charleston with a load of gasoline, one of these big old tankers. And he started under that railroad and his truck began to skid and he lost control and hit that cement column that I don't know how many thousands of gallons of gas he had, that thing exploded, set him on fire. 
And he was pinned in that cab. And that patrolman said, Preacher, he said that man begged me to shoot him until he died. He said, Officer, please shoot me. Please have mercy on me and shoot me. He couldn't shoot that man. He couldn't kill that man. He knew he was dying. He knew that he couldn't get him out. There was no way to get him out. From the human standpoint, he was as good as dead. And he was begging to die, but the patrolman couldn't shoot him. Eventually, the flames killed him. And he fell over. And then, of course, they pulled his body no more than a cinder out after the fire. But you know, there's souls in hell tonight that's been there 4,000, 5,000, 5,500 years burning, blazing, begging, twisting, tormented, perplexed, terrified, begging but they can't get out and you and I sit around here saying oh how I love Jesus Lord send me I wonder if we really mean it do we really mean it God help us to mean it amen say well the rich man said I'm tormented and John tells us the beast and the false prophet we're cast in the lake of fire and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. And the devil will be cast in he'll be tormented. The beast worshippers were tormented day and night and the smoke of their torment are up forever and ever. Day and night, tormented, tormented. Hell is a place of torment. But then I read something else. You know this man that called me, he couldn't even cry. Listen, don't you ever criticize anybody at a funeral that don't cry. Don't ever. When you see a person walk up to a casket and look in the face of their mother, their little baby, their husband, their wife, and they can't shed a tear, don't say that person don't care. They didn't care. They're glad they're dead. They don't have any feeling. Ninety-nine chances to one, they're suffering a hundred times more than the person that's crying. I read, and you just, you, you just copy these down because I cannot and I will not turn to them. I have a paper clip in my Bible at every one of them, but I didn't intend to read them. I just put it there. I don't have time. I have the, I have the references jotted down. You jot them down. Matthew 8, 12. Matthew 22, 13. Matthew 24, 51. Matthew 25, 30. And Luke 13, 28. Now I'll give them to you again in case... You're interested. In Matthew 8, 12, Matthew 22, 13, Matthew 24, 51, Matthew 25, 30, and Luke 13, 28. You know what those verses say, all of them? You know what they say? In one form or another, it says that the wicked, the ungodly, the lost, were cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Some of you dear sinners, and I say that with all the love that God Almighty will give me, I say it in love and not sarcasm. Some of you dear sinners, you can't bear, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to change that. I'm going to tell you what somebody told me. Somebody told me they were invited to this service tonight and they told me that they could not come. Now, don't take this wrong here because you don't know who the person is. And you don't know one thing about them. But this person said, I can't come to the tabernacle tonight and sit through that service because I can't bear all that noise, all that shouting, all that hallelujah, glory to God, amen. I can't stand it. I'd be a nervous wreck. When I got out. Now wait a minute. Now wait a minute. I don't know anything about the condition of that person physically. Now it could be. It could be. 
that somebody who is a born-again Christian would get into a position from the nervous system. I mean, I don't, I'm not a doctor. It could be, it could be that some Christian couldn't sit through this service or any service where there is a lot of shouting or noise or even loud singing or even loud preaching. There are no doubt some people that couldn't bear to hear me preach because they say I preach too loud. Now, I wouldn't send them to hell for it. I'd pull them out if I could. But I'm saying that some dear sinners can't bear a little noise in the house of God, but if you don't get saved, you're going to hell, and you're going to be in the noisiest place you've ever been. And you'll never get out, my friend. You'll never get out. Now, you know, I looked up every one of those words. You say, did you look up weep? I certainly did. You know what it means to weep? You say, certainly I do. You know what causes tears? Do you know what makes tears run out of the corners of your eyes? Do you know? Do you, do you know? It's pressure. That's what the dictionary said. Pressure. You know, when you hear of a tragedy, and somebody says, for instance, I remember when I was over in uh, Ashburn, North Carolina meeting and the church phone rang and the pastor's secretary answered it and came out to the trailer and said, Mr. Green, there's a call for you. I went in and took the, picked up the receiver and the man who was my tent caretaker at that time, he said, Oliver, your daddy just dropped dead a few minutes ago. You know what? My heart began to see, it seemed, I didn't, but my heart seemed to me began to swell and get tight. And my lungs began to get tight. And in a few minutes, they began to relax when the tears started rolling down my cheek. Pressure. Pressure. I looked up that word weep, and here's what it means. It means to be sorrowful. It means to be filled with grief. It means to be overcome with anguish. It means to display anguish with an outcry. If I could stick this microphone into hell and leave it five seconds, every sinner in Greenville would get saved. If they could hear the screams and the moans and the groans and the outcry of the souls in hell. I looked up that word wail. You know what it means to wail? Webster says it means to it means prolonged weeping prolonged crying listen to me will you prolonged grief and prolonged excruciating pain that's what it means to wail 